Hey, everybody, this is Pastor Derek here. I am with Ralph and my brother Ralph, brother Mark, and brother Keith, and we are diving into um, Jesus' cursing of the fig tree in Matthew 21. So uh, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and find your way there, and Mark is going to read the passage for us. So Mark, go ahead and read from uh, Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse 18. Okay. In the morning, as Jesus was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry. And he noticed a fig tree beside the road. He went over to see if there were any figs, but there were only leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the fig tree withered up. The disciples were amazed when they saw this and asked, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? Then Jesus told them, I tell you the truth. If you have faith and don't doubt, you can do that and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen you can pray for anything and if you have faith you will receive it all right um thanks for sharing that passage scripture with us mark uh what do y'all think what do you think when you um when you see this passage what comes to mind thoughts questions uh people like to eat figs in that <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. They like figs. Yeah, they like figs. Throughout throughout the uh, all of the Bible in the Old Testament, even we see that figs were very common in that area. And um, what I mean, what's Jesus' issue with a fig tree? You know, this is um, this is one of only two miracles that are destructive miracles, where where something is destroyed. One is the fig tree. The other is the pigs that go in the water. So Jesus mm -hmm. is kind of known for giving life. Uh, bringing restoration. So what's what's Jesus' issue with a fig tree? You know, a lot of people come to this and say that. Man, why is Jesus so upset with a fig tree? Um, it didn't have, it seems very selfish of Jesus, right? Hey, there's no, I'm hungry. It doesn't have food, so I'm going to wither the fig tree. Well, that, that's the thing. You just said it. Jesus was hungry. And um, there's a lot of symbolism here with with um, this and, and Israel and and uh, Jerusalem in itself, as he's going to Jerusalem, um, he's returning to the city and he's hungry. Um, there's several times throughout uh, scripture also, he looks at the city. And as you're going, you see the city. You see everything about it. And he knows what Jerusalem is. He knows what the temple is. He knows it's a place where people go to meet God. Um, I almost kind of see it as Jesus was hungry to see Jerusalem know who he was, to know God fully, to know God truly. Um, he said he came to fulfill the prophecies. Um, I think that's a great point, that he had, he had a desire for Jerusalem that Jerusalem did not have for itself. Um, mm -hmm. Keith, in your, in your reading on this, um, what does a fig tree represent? Well, I, uh, it's actually, I'd look at it as being a miracle and a parable, because the miracle is it, it cursed it and it, it died right then and there. In the parable, uh, the fig tree represents Jerusalem, Israel, the children of Israel. Yeah, and I think um, it's either, I think it's Jerusalem in general, the, but I also um, think it's the, it's the system, the governmental and, and specifically the religious system that's set up in Jerusalem. Now, how does that compare to a fig tree? A fig tree is supposed to have fruit. What is a religious system? Ralph, you hinted on this already, but what is a religious system sp supposed to do for the people? What, what was specifically the Jewish religious system supposed to do for the people? It's to bear fruit, to bear fruit of, of good things, of, of godly things. Yeah, right. So this comes along and Jesus comes along and uses this, like you said, Keith, very well said. It's a miracle and a parable. I honestly think it's more parable than even miracle at this point in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, is anybody really shocked that Jesus can wither a fig tree? I mean, everything he's already done, this is on the order of um, uh, am amazement of miracles. This is a pretty small one, but it is so symbolic. It also comes at an interesting point um, chronologically. And, and as you read Matthew and Mark, uh, you, you get the idea that, so it's interesting in Mark, Mark tells the story a little differently than Matthew. And he says, um, he tells it this way. He says, uh, let's see, fig tree, temple, 
fig tree temple. That's, I believe, Mark's order. I got to double check myself on that. Where um, Matthew says, yeah, that's correct. Matthew says, temple, fig tree, temple. So either Mark or Matthew, as they tell this, re recall what happened here. They, they sandwich the temple in there. Um, so Jesus cleanses the temple, curses the fig tree, and then the scribes and Pharisees say, how did you have the authority to do what you did in the temple? And Jesus explains. So the fig tree is, is tied into the, um, uh, to the symbolism of the temple. Um, Mark, what are your thoughts on this? See, it seems like you got something to throw in down there. <laughs> well, I know too that uh, just talking about what fig trees were supposed to do, um, I think several times are also a place of rest and shade and, you know, peace, I guess, comfort for the people as well. And, you know, they, the religious system wasn't like, like Ralph brought out and you brought out too. So um, just to, to show that this, this tree wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing, you know, was the point, I think that the spiritual system wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing. And a um, couple of references in, in, um, the Hebrew scriptures that, that talk about um, judgment, God's judgment coming. And it's like a fig tree that doesn't produce figs. And in other words, it's not doing what it's designed to do. And it's not providing for the people what it's supposed to provide. So um, if you're reading this at home and you think, why is Jesus upset with a fig tree? Um, he's not upset with a fig tree. He, he, this is really a pronouncement of judgment on um, the temple system, the religious system, and we're going to see that borne out in just a little less than uh, a generation, as Jesus predicts in other places that uh, the temple is going to be destroyed. And that, that brings me to, to the next part. So Jesus and the disciples have this discussion in the wake of the fig tree. Um, Jesus tells them, you know, you're amazed that this fig tree withered. But I, I'm telling you that if you have faith and do not doubt, then not only can you do what's been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. Um, that word this is, is, a, is a specifically used word. It doesn't say a mountain, but this mountain. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is not teaching us that faith can move mountains. Faith can move any mountain. I believe that if uh, God wants to move Mount Everest and throw it into um, the deepest canal in the ocean, he can do it. That's what he can do. But it seems in this moment that he's talking about a specific mountain, seems to be the Temple Mount, that there's judgment is coming on this Temple Mount, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be destroyed. And it's one of many places where Jesus predicts the destruction of the Temple that occurred in 70 A.D. Uh, God did bring His judgment on that that Temple system. So um, how does this apply to us? It's a fig tree. It's a Temple. It's it's um, it's 2,000 years later. How does this apply to us? I think um, I think one way, just going back to what the fig tree was, you know, how it looked. It looked, it appeared that it was, you know, would have a lot of fruit because of the leaves, the outward appearance. But uh, then when Jesus got there, it, you know, the figs weren't there first, and like it was supposed to be. Uh, I think for us, it's definitely a reminder that you know we're always to be looking at what's on the inside and not just on what's on the outside. Uh, of our own lives and then uh, leadership as well. So I think that's important truth. Hmm. Yes, well said, Mark. I, I hope that we cannot say of First Baptist Tillman's Corner that we are a tree that has leaves but no fruit. It hmm. looks like it should be a place for people to come to be ministered to, to be cared for, to hear the gospel, to grow in their faith. But when they get there, there's really no fruit. There's just a lot of leaves. You no. Know, um, Sorry, um, I was I was when I was reading, um, and I don't know how this correlates, but uh, they said that Adam and Eve used the fig leaves to cover themselves, and I, I kind of thought like with the leaves here that were like Mark said that were there, but there was no fruit. It was a covering, and you couldn't see the fruit. But once you got up close, you could really see there was no fruit, and almost like the covering of the sin of the shame of Adam and Eve. When they cover themselves, uh, we can cover ourselves with leaves all, all over the place. But when people get really close, they know who you are. Then they see. And I think Jesus, he sees beyond the, the, the fig leaves. He, he, we can't hide anything from him. I think that's very well said. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And I had not made that connection to the very first 
attempt at humans to uh, really for self-righteousness was with fig leaves. And now you've got, you know, thousands of years later, Jesus saying, hey, you've got an attempt to make it look like something is happening here. And you've got all this busyness, so much busyness. I mean, that is the central part of the religious life of the people of Israel. So much busyness going on. Uh, and even in, at this time, you've got Passover. So everybody's coming in for this huge celebration, all this symbolism, and there's really, uh, there's really no fruit to it. That's, that's very well said. Uh, that's, a, that's a good connection, good tie there. Can I read a quote from uh, Spurgeon? Is that okay? Always. Spurgeon is always allowed. All right. So <laughs> on this same topic here in the sermon he preached back in uh, 1889, he says that uh, he looks for fruit from the preacher, from the Sunday school teacher, from the church officer, from the sister who conducts a Bible class, from that brother who has a band of young men around him to whom he is a guide in the gospel. He does expect it of all who submit to his gospel rule. As Christ had a right to expect fruit of a leaf bearing fig tree, so he has a right to expect great things from those who avow themselves his trustful followers. I just thought that was pretty good right along with what, what, what y'all are saying. On earth. That's powerful. Yeah. And that extends out from us as, as pastors and leaders all the way to parents, um, Christian parents, wherever we are when we follow Christ. You're right. He has the right to expect fruit from his followers. Um, it is well said. So I do want to address one other issue. One, one is on just the um, something that kind of a journey I went on a few years ago to really find every supposed contradiction in the, the Gospels. You know, well, one says it happened here. One said it happened there. Uh, one said there were two people. This other gospel says there were one. And I tried to go through as best I could and, and got in, even into a conversation with a critic of scripture. And um, I said, show me every contradiction that you can find. And I want to study them for myself. I want to see if they're really contradictions or not. It's interesting because the fig tree was the hardest one. Um, all the other contradictions, honestly, just reading the scripture, comparing the two, and, um, and seeing, well, this is a level of detail. This person gives detail that the other person doesn't give, and, it, you know, you move on. Uh, but this one was interesting to me. Um, I, I do feel uh, very confident now that I understand why it seems like a contradiction. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Matthew seems to put these two events together. The fig tree is cursed, and the disciples see the cursed fig tree, and Jesus teaches about faith that can move mountains. Uh, Mark separates them. So Mark says, Jesus cursed the fig tree, and then the next day, they have this discussion about the cursed fig tree. Uh, as I read it now, I, I understand that, yes, Matthew's putting these two events together, but he's not necessarily saying they happened at the same time. He's putting them together because he wants to highlight the, the conversation about the mountain and the cursed fig tree. And so he needs to give us the background information that the fig tree had been cursed. He just doesn't specifically tell us it happened the day before. Uh, but as I was reading this, and, and again, I was discussing this with a, a critic of the Bible who was a, a professing atheist. And so we were back and forth on all these contradictions and came down to the fig tree. And honestly, at the time, I couldn't wrap my mind around it. And I remember having this conversation and the guy said, see, I told you, you can't trust the Bible because uh, Matthew says the fig tree was cursed on one day and Mark says it was cursed on another day. And, you know, it just hit me in the middle of that conversation. I said, you know what? We've gone through every contradiction that we that you could find and that I could find, supposed contradiction in the gospel accounts. And now we're down to discussing a fig tree. And we're not asking, was the fig tree cursed? We're not asking, was the fig tree cursed by Jesus? And we're not even asking if the disciples had this conversation. All that is, all those details are exactly the same. We're asking, did it happen on Monday or did it happen on Tuesday? And we're talking about an event that happened 2,000 years ago. If after studying all the contradictions in the Gospels, that's the place we come where we just can't understand how these two accounts fit together, I feel like I'm in a pretty good place. Uh, I felt pretty confident about the reliability of Scripture. So um, I think this instance, although it is hard to wrap our minds around, you know, when exactly did it happen and what's the timing of it, um, as I read it, I feel very confident that the fig tree is cursed on one day and the conversation of, about it happens the next morning as they're coming into Jerusalem. But uh, I just wanted this to be kind of a test case for those people who hear all the time, well, there are contradictions all over the gospels. Um, this is 
by many accounts, the most difficult um, contradiction to reconcile in the Gospels. And, and just think about the enormity of that statement that we can know to, from 2,000 years later that these accounts line up so much that that's really the, the place that we, uh, we have the biggest struggle with. So any other thoughts on this before we wrap up our time together? I did have one one thought as I was reading through. I thought this kind of hit me uh, about the seriousness of of the temple, about the seriousness of our faith, and about the patience of God uh, as well. Um, so what I was reading about fig trees is that it takes a lot of time for them to grow and produce fruit, and it takes a lot of labor. It's labor intensive. So for him to curse the fig tree and say, you'll never have any more fruit on it. It took a lot of time for that fruit to grow on there. Hmm. And um, now that it's not producing fruit, he says, you're no more. And, uh, and if, if, that, if that happened to all of the fig trees in that area, man, that would, that would cause a little bit of calamity. Um, because economically, they use the figs for a lot of things. Um, and so I think, you know, just the time it would take and the, the amount of, of calamity that would be caused by not having that there, could we imagine what it would be like to not have the church, to not have the place where people go uh, to, to meet with God? And at that time, that's where they went. Now, we, we know that Jesus, um, it took a lot of time for him to grow into that ministry as well, and he was destroyed. And but three days he was raised back, and that's the hope that we have is that we still have someone to go to, and that uh, we can go to God through Jesus. Um, and we 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 have a journey of faith that takes a long time, um, and even through um, times where there's seems to be no fruit in our life, Jesus redeems that, and Amen. so that's and that's, just all I think that. that's. I think it's a great point, Ralph, um, because what's happening as the temple is, is fading and is under judgment, God's bringing a new temple in Jesus so that now the relationship we have with God on earth is not through, through that temple building, but it's through Jesus, who God, God on earth, uh, God dwelling with his people on earth, and then an extension of that, the church. That's why Paul says we are the temple, it, yes, individually, but, but also collectively. And so we're the place where people connect with God on earth. And, um, and yeah, we, we want God to maintain our ministry and it is only by the grace of God that we have a ministry and it could be removed, but God will have a backup plan, uh, not a backup plan. God doesn't have backup plans. Uh, God has a plan and that plan is either us as we're faithful and obedient or God will use somebody else. That's what he does. Well, and he does, um, in Matthew 24, he says that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So his word is truth, and, and, and even though all the other things will pass away, his truth remains. Amen. Keith, Mark, any closing thoughts? Good stuff. That's good. All right. Well, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Again, if you have any questions about um, Passion Week or any of the events that happen there, let us know, and we'll, we'll do our best to, uh, to address them uh, during our time together. Uh, God bless, and as you walk through this week as a follower of Christ, um, read through the Gospels, read through Matthew chapter 21 um, and, and following and just read about what uh, the events that took place during this week and we'll see you guys tomorrow.